Hello. <laughs> mm. Yes, hi everyone. <laughs> Um, welcome. Um, you just saw the virtual space that we are in uh, at the W139. Um, my name is Margarita Osipian and um, I'm organizing this event called Solidarity Sessions um, together with the W139 uh, platform Beka and we have uh, Kuhn, uh, Sep and uh, uh, who else is here from platform Beka? Oh yes. <laughs> Tatiana. Oh yeah, Tatiana. Thank you. Um, and um, yes, and the Salvo Foundation, if I forgot to mention. So uh, thank you so much for everyone joining us here in this really amazing kind of uh, spatial setup that's been created for us. Um, and the idea behind this event was to bring people together to talk about the impact of the corona crisis and the quarantine on the cultural sector, and also to share information and resources from lawyers, cultural workers, um, our union representatives and others who are organizing and advocating around these issues. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little introduction of how things are gonna go for, um, cause it's gonna be split into um, kind of like three parts uh, for the evening. Um, and we're gonna begin with uh, talks from cultural workers who are gonna share their own stories of the impact of the quarantine and the advocacy work that they're doing. And then in the second part, um, which is going to be moderated by uh, Kuhn and Sepp from Platform Beka. We're going to focus more on uh, the current legal and financial implications of the crisis and the advocacy work that is being done by unions and cultural lobbying organizations. Um, just so you know, like each talk is going to be quite short, around five minutes. But after all the talks, um, there's going to be a longer question and answer period, which is going to be moderated by Nadia from the W139. So, um, we had asked people to send in questions in advance, but you are also um, more than welcome to ask questions over YouTube. So uh, lots of you are saying hi in the chat. Um, so when you have a question that comes to mind, uh, just post it right away in the chat and we're gonna keep track of it. So you don't have to wait until uh, the Q&A period. If someone is talking and something comes to you, uh, just ask that question. And then when we do our question and answer period, that's when we're gonna tackle those questions um, and direct them to the right people. Um, okay, so uh, let's begin. Um, so as I said, like in this first part, um, we're gonna, talk to, uh, to cultural workers, hear some more like personal individual stories, um, which often get left out of these conversations. And the first person um, that we're gonna hear from is uh, Asan Farjadnian. And uh, he's a visual artist, performer, video artist, and activist. Um, so when the quarantine started, he became uh, much more active uh, with vlogging, especially about the topic of his own housing situation um, and speaking publicly about this situation. Um, and through these uh, vlogs that he posts um, over Facebook, he's been able to show also the importance of speaking out and the importance of engaging uh, with government officials about these precarious situations that we find ourselves in. So I'm gonna turn it uh, over to uh, Asan to uh, continue the conversation. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you, Margarita, uh, for your uh, introduction, and thank you all for being here, and uh, also to W139 for organizing this really necessary uh, conversation that we should uh, have. Um, I just want to get right into it, uh, what happened uh, to me. So um, I am a visual artist, performance, and video artist, and I've been living in Netherlands. And all these 10 years I have been, uh, as a visual artist, contributing to the city by having uh, uh, two or three uh, projects in Amsterdam uh, uh, yearly. Um, and all of these years I have been living in a very precarious situation. Uh, that is, uh, due to basically having temporary contracts and uh, being unable to pay for uh, a, a studio or uh, 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 or, a, or a house, basically. Um, so uh, I have been living with uh, uh, anti-crack organizations who um, 
actually basically they push you to sign an agreement that they can put you on the street basically without any rehousing uh, in one month in advance and uh, this situation started especially in uh, uh, in March they actually told me that I need to move out uh, in the beginning of April and um, well, the, then was the corona was coming actually to to, to the Netherlands, and the uh, the numbers was rising, and uh, the measures of quarantine uh, and uh, start start uh, being realized in the city. And in that moment, I actually asked the uh, uh, anti crack organization if they had a rehousing uh, for me by email, and they uh, said uh, two times actually that they could not provide anything. In that moment, I made a research and I found out that uh, the uh, owner of this uh, house where I am is a social housing. Uh, it's called Aicha Hart. So in that moment, I wrote an email to them asking if they had any uh, other house for me. And unfortunately, they also replied that, uh, no, there is no other uh, opportunity for you. So in that moment, I wrote another email to the Gemeente uh, asking the same question and uh, they even didn't respond to me. And uh, I received a telephone call from KKZ uh, saying that uh, if I would become homeless, there would be no uh, shelter for me because the shelters are uh, full. So when I asked them where did they get my number, it was from the Gemeente of Amsterdam. So, <laughs> so in that moment, uh, there was basically no options anymore. And uh, in that moment, I uh, uh, spoke to many friends about about what is going on and start vlogging about it, basically telling the story what I said, uh, in short, and posting it. And in, on Facebook, I knew some uh, people from the municipality, um, and I spoke to them, and they said that uh, they will they will support my case, and they start speaking to uh, 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 to to their colleagues in the Gemeente. Um, but still, that couldn't uh, solve any of my problems uh, because I was still going to be evicted. And in that time, I joined a group uh, that is called uh, uh, Union for Precarious Living, both for precarious owner. And with them, we start thinking about the strategy, uh, how to tackle this problem. And, um, and, uh, and their advices were really great, actually, in that moment. So. Um, so we start campaigning, we start creating hashtag stop uh, uh, evictions. And in that moment, after uh, a week or two, uh, then also one important thing that happened in that moment is that the uh, journalists start talking to me from the program uh, called The Monitor, which is, uh, which is a very uh, well-written uh, uh, journal and also a television program. So they wanted to cover my story, and uh, in that moment, they called the housing corporation saying, are you seriously putting someone on the street during pandemic? And in that moment, the housing corporation started responding to them saying that, no, they're not going to put anyone on the street, and they will give me a month uh, extension on my eviction. Um, so uh, in that moment, I had a little guarantee. I know my time is running out. Uh, but uh, a little guarantee, but then again, the guarantee was for one month, and I had to uh, start another uh, uh, whole campaign to get another month extra, uh, and that is coming to the end, beginning of June. Um, so, and still, there is uh, no certainty for me, and no other possibilities for uh, housing or affordable housing. Um, so, that is the situation. My five minutes is up, so I start. I stop here. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that story. I mean, I think it really shows um, also the complexities of the situations that people are in and uh, how things sort of get piled up on top of each other, that you're in one bad situation and it sort of is like a snowball effect. Um, I think it's something really important to uh, talk about also later when we uh, talk about like lobbying efforts and also uh, sort of legal rights that people have. Um, so uh, next up, um, I want to invite uh, Alina Lupu, um, who's an artist uh, who's been dealing with um, the relationships between precarious labor, cultural work, and the platform economy in her practice. Um, and also I think in her life in general. Um, and she's also, uh, right now she's been publishing a semi-regular series called Our New Normal, 
um, on uh, the talk website um, about her reflections on the quarantine. Um, so I'd like to bring up uh, Alina to uh, speak right now. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully this works. Right. Um, I think, I mean, I've been stuck to this couch since, since this morning and, and Zoom chats and Jitsi chats and all the chats possible. Uh, and I, I start with that by saying that I have the, the advantage of being able to stay at home during these times. So I didn't go to, uh, through, the same, uh, through the same experience of feeling that I have precarious housing during a quarantine and feeling that I'm going to be evicted. At the same time, I've been, I graduated art school almost four years ago. I didn't have the pressure of needing to adapt the way in which I study into an online environment overnight. Uh, I also don't work within, the, within an art school, so I didn't have to reshape my curriculum to that. Uh, and I don't know, I think I'm, I'm pretty good, all things considered. I applied for for support and in terms of uh, for for as is a pair and I got that along with my partner. So I don't think I have anything to complain about. At the same time, this is not what this is about. I think the the point is realizing the position you're in and realizing looking around the changes that happen in the art field as a result of this this quarantine. Uh, um, these changes from a position of relative comfort or something that I could reflect upon um, while writing my pieces for TAC over the past few weeks. So I try to almost, uh, well, almost every week, I try to, to take a new topic. I try to talk about, about precarious housing. I try to talk about precarious, uh, yeah, precarious education. I try to talk about social distancing in general and what, the quarantine has been doing to us and the way in which it's shaping our, our artistic practices and in way in which it's shaping us as as individuals and also the way in which is bringing us together i mean this event is is proof of that i would say um and i think yeah basically i think it's good to also realize when you have the comfort to talk about these issues and to speak up about them yeah it's that's it in short <laughs> no i mean it's hard to really how can i say this in a way it's good to be to be present in this virtual environment but after all the reflections that I've been publishing online with the help of, of uh, Margarita, with the help of, uh, of SEP, with the help of, um, of uh, people at TAC, I'm hoping that all these changes that are happening now will kind of be reshaped and we will be able to look at our field a bit differently once all this is done. Because, yeah, <laughs> trying to keep up the spirits. I think that's that's enough for me now. Thanks, Margarita. Thank you so much, Alina. Um, yeah, I think you touched on something we'll kind of get to towards the end as well, um, which is um, sort of thinking about not just the impact that the situation has on us as like individuals working within the cultural field, but also thinking about it on a larger scale. Um, so, uh, Next, I want to um, invite uh, Julia Sokolnika to uh, speak. Um, she's an experimental and documentary filmmaker, writer and researcher, um, and she's been doing a lot of organizing work um, among tenants of the uh, urban resort and other broodplatz um, in the Netherlands to call for rent uh, reliefs. So uh, Julia, I'd like to welcome you. Hi. Um, yeah, I... Uh, started my quarantine with uh, Mondrian Fonds meeting about uh, um, a series of presentations in Brazil. So that's not going to happen. And uh, basically my entire uh, year uh, went into pieces. So the first uh, two weeks of, or three weeks of the quarantine, I had to, I'm calling it a quarantine, but I mean, mean like governmental um, restrictions that basically 
made a, it impossible for artists for a lot of artists to work um and the first few weeks i just was picking up pieces and trying to uh, reschedule my projects and basically what has been haunting me through this entire process is this sense of time and um an ability to build timelines and also this um a rhythmic rhythm of how the um, govern, uh, government is issuing information is like every four weeks. So um, I feel like there's a lot of struggle in that and kind of trying to find uh, a new horizon in, in trying to find a new um, direction and also uh, doing the math because, uh, well, I have been living with the Brutplatz system uh, for five years now. First at Brutplatz Wow, now at Brutplatz Lely. Um, uh, this uh, is my way of trying to uh, stay afloat, working on projects with, that are not very lucrative. Like, I'm, I'm basically poor. I have no savings. Uh, so uh, the moment when I have no savings and I have no job and I also still have to pay uh, my quite high rent um, is something that stresses me a lot. And uh, uh, instead of diving into the anxiety, I decided to uh, to just like really uh, create a, rea a cer certain rea realism around it and to see how many people around me are in the same situation. Uh, and well, at the same time, uh, I did know that uh, there is a huge mess. Uh, some uh, artists are still students. Some artists are ZZ pairs. I am uh, quite lucky uh, to be having a steady income in, with my company for the last three years and I applied for the scheme. I still haven't really received the uh, confirmation that I got it, but um, I can, with a little difficulty, uh, stay afloat uh, receiving that uh, funding. Uh, but my uh, landlord, um, or la rather a, an administration company that is running my Brutplatz, really tried, started to push uh, the tenants uh, to pay up, uh, what, to basically um, promise that we will pay up uh, our rents without waiting for... Um, for, for, for more, without giving us actually more time, which is what we need now to realize where we're standing. So we were expected to already sign up uh, agreements that we will be paying the rent in the next uh, six months in installments, uh, still without people actually receiving a letter from the Hemente that, that they're eligible for the Tozo, still without people knowing if they are even um, able to apply for the scheme, if they are also visa applicants, uh, and so on and so on. So um, I'm actually really busy for the last few weeks writing letters and creating um, a list of tenants that is not... Uh, belonging like the information the information politics even plays plays some role in it because we didn't really have a community we were just filling the building and now we are trying to create this like um grassroots uh, um community like we really gra do grassroots work to create a community and to gain each other's trust and also we have great partners because in the building where i where i live actually uh, there is uh um, well, the Gallery de Apple that wrote a beautiful letter, um, kind of like a manifesto of care, I would say, uh, which also uh, claims that we should not hurry. <laughs> and I think that this is kind of like an important uh, prerogative for the, for the entire process of um, discussion of our economical reality is like, where are we in terms of time and what do we need in terms of time? Um, so yeah, that's what I was busy with. <laughs> basically. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm just curious, is there, if people are in a similar situation as you, um, is there a way that they can get in touch with you to sort of uh, join together or uh, get some extra support if they don't see like a kind of um, collective action happening within their own studio space? We do. Uh, we we already um, have been working a little bit uh, on that with Rosa van Tesfelde for from the Amsterdam Labour Community. 
city who also are in the building. And uh, well, slowly by slowly, we're really trying to uh, create some kind of connection between the Brutplatz. And uh, I'm personally in touch with people from WOW. Uh, but uh, also, uh, each each building has a different rent, different um, also different demography in a sense that in our building, there is a specific situation of um, companies and institutions who have a much more powerful saying um, compared to tenants who are living here. So the, the difference between the atelier and the atelier of owning at the end really pays, um, like really changes the dynamics of the situation because people are simply afraid to be homeless. So they're really signing um, agreements, assuming that it's their responsibility to stay uh, to keep the roof over their head and they would rather borrow the money than to be homeless whereas we are claiming that the private artists should be treated the same as uh, a cultural institution because we are uh, most of all as are forced to be entrepreneurs so um, it's important to know that uh, going into debt should not be expected from us basically yeah thank you so much Julia um, and uh, now we're reaching the end of this first uh, section, um, and I wanted to uh, end it off by uh, inviting uh, Yara Saeed, um, who's a visual artist um, and also the initiator of the Salva Foundation, uh, which is a platform that supports newcomer artists and cultural workers through a wide range of programming and support networks. Um, and. Uh, I just wanted to invite Yara to talk a bit about uh, what the Salva Foundation is doing um, and also uh, her own situation if she wants to. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, basically, uh, we founded the Salva Foundation about two years ago to be a physical space that could um, um, facilitate for artists who are new in the Netherlands a sort of environment where they can experiment with their work and get feedback on it. Um, as simple as that, we can say it today. And um, we've been having a lot of um, events last year um, where we invite artists to um, give talks and uh, give workshops. And we've collaborated with Margarita a couple of times to give uh, funding uh, workshops uh, which were quite uh, popular and uh, I think we can see now that there was so much need for it and so much necessity as like this is actually the situation I feel is such a reflection of our reality and like this sort of instability is so for me it's so I feel it's so um, <laughs> um, I don't feel it's unusual at all I feel it's so usual because I've been my life has been a roller coaster for the last 10 years and uh, it comes as I feel like I've heard a lot of people now saying that this is like um, I've always been living like this as an artist or like I've always like I don't know it's like comes like a sort of a privilege for the artist that their life is always ups and downs and they always don't uh, mostly can't afford to uh, pay their rent or have a stable income but I think what for me um, personally what's really have made me quite worried is that I felt like I've like during this lockdown, I felt like I went back to the point, like the moment of arriving here and knowing no one because the community that I have built and I've known suddenly it disappeared. And I felt like I was completely alone again and I don't see people and I don't have people to call and go visit and I don't have places to go and see. So, um, yeah, I think for me, Salwa Foundation is all about community. And now I see the need for these little communities, even though Amsterdam has been pressuring us and really like like choking us with all these regulations and all these high prices and high rents and high. Um, I feel like there was so much anxiety going on between everyone. And everyone is talking now about self-reflection. <laughs> but I feel like we're so confronted of something that is so present in also other areas of the world. And now we just, I feel like, yeah, we just have to, uh, I feel a lot. <laughs> but I also am very scared of this loss of um, support that I feel uh, we try to do it through these little sessions that uh, I've been 
uh, trying to commit myself to do lately, um, which I think are very important. Uh, but it's also, um, yeah, reminding us of uh, how important we are to each other. Yeah, I don't know. So that's what we do at Salon. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've also uh, been posting links to people's websites, also to the Salvo website um, on YouTube. So, uh, just go there to find uh, all the links of everything we've been talking about so far. Um, and uh, yeah, now I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Sepp and uh, Kuhn who are gonna take over um, uh, into this next part. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. It will be just Sepp since of uh, meter and a half distance measures. Kuhn can't be on the screen with me today, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, everyone speaking for uh, like so clearly setting the stage and addressing all the urgencies, which were the incentives to organize this event to get there. Uh, so we now come to the part where we uh, invite four uh, people and organizations uh, who are working in the interest of the artists and the culture workers to contribute from their specific uh, point of view. Uh, and I happen to be the person who has the honor to announce them, but also I happen to be the a part of the first organization to speak, which is Platform BK, Platform Building Kunst. So uh, to very, very briefly introduce who we are, uh, we're an active think tank, uh, which means that we do a broad range of things, uh, going from uh, lobby for better policies, uh, such as the Kunst National Arium, Artist Fee, and the Fair Practice Code, uh, but we also publish texts to stimulate the public debate about the position of the arts, and we organize campaigns, uh, debates, uh, act activist interventions, so that's also why we're here today. Uh, and we're a member-based self-organized or, uh, self -organized organization, which means that we are independent, or we're actually only dependent on our members. Um, and if you have, happen to have any questions about fair practice or the other things we do, please uh, post them in the YouTube comments, which goes, by the way, for all the talks that you'll hear now. Uh, we will go, go be going from talk to talk, and then after that, go to the Q&A. Uh, so please uh, just write any question that you have down immediately, and they'll be uh, collected and directed towards one of the speakers. Please also indicate clearly to which of the speakers you want to direct your question. Uh, that makes it a lot easier for us. So now uh, our first speaker will be from uh, Platform BK, uh, is uh, Tatjana Macic. Uh, she's an artist, writer, researcher, and educator, uh, and a long-term collaborator of Platform BK. Uh, she is uh, one of our experts on the issue of studio and living spaces, and she'll talk about the urgency of action uh, on those topics that were already mentioned a few times and uh, what are possible ways of acting together. Hello everyone. Hey, hello. Thanks um, uh, for introducing me and thank you W139 and everybody who contributed to organize this. It's really needed and very much appreciated. Um, well, um, right now uh, the, the art scene is quite fragmented, but also the system in which we operate, the art policy system, um, um, is also very fragmented. So it's kind of difficult to to kind of match these two fragmented systems. And I think this is why uh, we sometimes very much feel lost and don't know how to proceed. Um, I've been involved with Platform BK for many years now. So just to give you a few highlights, in 2017, we organized a manifest for keeping the studio spaces affordable in Amsterdam, uh, which was signed by many, many organizations in Amsterdam, many people presented to the mun municipality, to councilmen, including the vet Howder of culture, who was the Miss um, Olongren, um, and they all really wanted to support us. But this is a very complex matter. Many people are involved, many um, uh, organizations, many uh, policy makers, many players in the field, uh, I shall say. Um, so it's quite difficult to move the needle, especially 
because uh, this policy uh, making uh, is a lot of different small, small, small steps. And if you lose a thread, if you miss one small step, which can have a snowball effect, um, you kind of uh, miss out a lot. So we are, um, uh, we have done uh, throughout the years in 2018, a lot of research and a lot of collecting information in Amsterdam, how are uh, artists organized, uh, Brutplatz, uh, uh, Freiplatz, uh, ateliers, uh, also in uh, outside of Amsterdam in uh, many different cities. We have this uh, beautiful report, which has um, um, uh, is, is a work of many people. Uh, and if you want to read it, it's um, you're very much welcome to. But as I said, right now the scene is quite fragmented and we actually need to question the laws and regulations that are in place. Uh, um, and we need to kind of play an active, more active role in it. So what we actually propose is for artists to be more united and that we self-organize ourselves. Not only the moments when there is this urgency, very obvious urgency, where now many people are losing their living spaces and studio spaces and livelihoods and projects and so on, but for a more durable and sustainable networking and, and, and uh, ways of living. So what we are actually proposing is to create a think tank within the Platform BK, uh, which is going to be solemnly uh, focused on um, atelier and artist studio policy and conditions for living and working for artists. Um, so we want to make a think tank um, where artists and uh, experts from different fields and cultural organizations will work together on two levels. One will be conceptual, so we will kind of think and rethink what is our role in the city? Can we imagine new types of cities? Can we imagine new types of cities when we have different working spaces, different buildings, different complex uh, environments where we really enjoy working and we, where we can contribute to the cities uh, and um, in different way because we are all creative, we all have ideas. Um, and uh, on a more on a other level, uh, there will be a direct involvement, uh, which also involves um, in several working groups. Uh, so we can actually, uh, our goal would be to uh, become a co-creators of the cities and our future, and to ensure long-term and short-term sustainable ec ecosystem of the arts in Amsterdam and the Netherlands when it comes to uh, working and living spaces in Amsterdam and around uh, around the country. So. We want to strengthen the position of the artist and to get the signals from the field in real time, because um, that's very important. Uh, when we get the si uh, signals in real time, we can also act in real time. So we, we can respond in real time. So we want to show and create solidarity amongst the artists on this issue and create a transparency about the systemic governmental structures, the funding and laws and regulations which is quite difficult. I can tell you, I've been involved with this for many years and it took me many years to just understand how is this all working? Who do you uh, actually speak to uh, when you have a problem and how do we all together contribute to a better policy? So also we want to give artists the possibility to have their voice heard in the policy making in the city. A very clear voice. Um, uh, in many cities, when I say the city, uh, I mean any city in, 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 in the Netherlands. Um, so we have people um, reaching out to us from, from Tilburg, Maastricht, to Groningen and Amsterdam uh, and all different kinds of cities. Uh, so we need to stay informed about the issues uh, and regulations and to anticipate and act in real time. So um, it will be really, really amazing if everybody who listens joins us um, we are going to start working on this program shortly. Uh, you can just send me an email, Tatiana at Platform BK, um, and see if you, if you have any ideas, if you have um, energy and you want to contribute, uh, show up and uh, just start contributing. Um, because we cannot do it alone. We can do, we are a small group of people, very energetic and very motivated, but we really need all of you. And that's my kind of motto of today, unite and organize. <laughs> Thank you, Tatjana, that's uh, loud and clear. <laughs> uh, perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, please uh, do post your questions or do send an email to tatjana at platformbk.nl.
Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce the next speaker, Natalie Harches, uh, who is director of the showroom Mama in Rotterdam uh, and board member of the Zach New. Uh, the Zach New is an association of exhibition spaces, uh, mostly smaller ones, such as artist run spaces like W139, which we are in now. Um, and in the current govern government measures to save the cultural sector, big museums will receive uh, emergency funding, but there is a lot to be gained for these smaller uh, exhibition spaces where living and often young artists actually get to make new work. Um, so uh, we invite uh, Natalie to speak of what the Zach New is doing at this moment and how artists and uh, presentation institutions can work together and build coalitions. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> thank you for welcoming me. And uh, apart from seconding all the thanks for organizing this event, I would briefly just want to uh, touch upon acknowledging uh, that for so many international art workers and artists here, already just having the stress of the inability of actually like traveling to family and loved ones or seeing your families dispersed over the globe is uh, a major issue. So I just want to acknowledge that fact and. Uh, share my support um, in those terms. Um, so uh, I'll just briefly, I think many of you might be aware of the Zach New, but not really understand what we do. So I would just like to introduce what we do in general and what we have been doing in the past weeks. Um, and then maybe from a more personal perspective, because I think the actions we are taking within uh, the organizations represented within or throughout the Zach New are on such a like individual contextual level that it's really hard for me to speak as like one representative for the whole membership. Uh, but to begin with, the Zach New uh, is an interest group or an advocacy group for the presentation in selling. And so we're talking about the visual art spaces such as W139 uh, or MAMA in Rotterdam. Uh, also uh, uh, spaces which are a bit uh, larger and institutional like Witte de Witt in Rotterdam to very small uh, but important residencies like Kunsthuis Siep. Uh, so there's a wide span of spaces represented within our membership and our focus uh, could be um, described as producing new work, facilitating presentations, talent development, and research for artists, living artists, um, uh, generally. Um, it also, we have a very wide membership. We've been uh, taking stock or making inventory of what kind of damages all our members are uh, experiencing in these past months. And um, it's not e like possible to pinpoint it under one moniker. Actually, a substantial amount of our membership uh, is not very reliant on ticket income. The risks we're looking ahead is that most of our members are really reliant on additional project funding, um, uh, a large or there are all kinds of complex structures like uh, Onomatope is supported by the, the province uh, of Brabant. Uh, but isn't in the uh, municipal multiple year plan. So within regulations or compensation now being formed, they might be looking to um, yeah, drop between the, the boat <laughs> and the coast, so to speak. Um, um, so we're trying to take, make inventory of that and all kinds of uh, complexities which arise um, and providing that information to the Mondrian Fund to the Vereniging Nederlandse Gemeente, uh, uh, so that's the association of the, uh, the Dutch Association of Municipalities to the Ministry, uh, in order to also just really make visible this layer, which is now determined to be outside of the so-called vitale instellingen uh, or out of the vital institutions. Uh, that said, um, we have yet to see because through the support package which is now offered money is also being redistributed to the cultural funds and therefore also the Mondrian funds and the Mondrian fund is now in preparation of what kind of support systems and structures uh, they are designing uh, within that emergency budget. Um, 
I've seen that Ilko was online, so maybe he can share some information on in the chat. I'm not sure. Like, I can't speak to that. But basically, at, at this point, we've like mostly been providing information as much as possible. Um, then maybe to leave that there, um, um, what Zach New has been working on very actively in the past, uh, in the past two years, and Peter van der Bunder here is here as well, is to create a guideline uh, for uh, fair pay in institutions such as ours. And we realized uh, um, a, a report and a guideline together with advice company Serum. Uh, of course, this is very stressful at this point because a lot of work has gone into actually designing a structure which we can say like these are our standards this is what we find is fair also it accommodates the different sizes and uh, operations of our very varied membership but um yeah i guess a large a large part of the impact is yet to follow following the uh, discussions of the budget in september so i would like to there's a plea i would <laughs> want to add is to also uh, maybe to second in with Tatiana, not only use this moment of momentum, but also keep holding on to that uh, because the impact of the situation where we find ourselves in is going to persevere over a, a large number of months. And we have to realize it's also being built on, a, and I think that also comes to the fore in what Eshan has been talking about uh, on, a, on foundations of uh, discrepancy. So... I think that's a, a whole situation we need to manage. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that, that's maybe a bit, bit of a scope for the Zach New. Uh, I could add a bit of what we're doing now at MAMA specifically, uh, where we have, uh, we're working on an upcoming project, uh, which we're moving, like rethinking, completely out of the showroom and trying to resist the rush of reopening with haste. I don't know if some of you have joined in the press conference just prior to this uh, uh, meeting, but the like 1st of June would be dates. Uh, uh, everybody's opening up as well. And uh, we will do trials with, you know, re engaging our community and gathering, but in small and contained spaces. But we don't want to get caught up in a kind of production madness, but be able to do our own projects. And within the upcoming project, we've actually been granted, which is very odd, but also very happy, a uh, grant by Stimuleringsfonds, which we heard just after the lockdown. So that's kind of like insane, but it allows us to expand the budget. And we've been rethinking with the programmers, Work Not, uh, a Iranian artist duo uh, based in Rotterdam, uh, that the artists they have invited to contribute to their show should conceive of their own practices also as collaborative practices invite other collaborators in so we are actively using this project to redistribute funds and um sharing the resources we have available within that framework um and maybe there's a thing i would like to add which has been like the advice of the Mondrian fund which uh, might not be as visible as it should be is that there's actually an advice to um, um, keep on uh, writing your applications and continuing your applications because those are the 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 measures they already and systems they already have in place uh, and are able to um, provide financial support for artists. So that's something to keep in mind. Thank you, Natalie, for. Uh all this, uh, these practicalities, I think that's uh, really useful. You also mentioned already uh, our previous, uh, our uh, next speaker. Uh, so uh, I uh, continue to introduce him, who is uh, Peter van der Bunder, uh, who is the visual arts expert of the Kunstbund, which is the Dutch Arts Union. Uh, he's also a founding member of the Creative Coalition, and I know him to be someone who knows every technical detail of policies uh, around freelancers in the arts, about uh, the lobby uh, for, of culture in The Hague, uh, and who also has, I know, a good insight in, on the 
numbers of the impact on the current of the current crisis on the arts uh, and knows of political strategies to create leverage. So um, here is Peter. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Seb. Um, uh, yes, I work with the Dutch Arts Union Kunstenbond, uh, and we uh, work a lot with Platform BK also in the, in the visual arts and in the the lobby, uh, and we have also uh, a broad organization, uh, the Creative Coalition, where uh, unions and uh, uh, groups from all uh, kinds of uh, cultural workers uh, unite. So it's photographers, it's uh, uh, location scouts for film, it's writers, it's visual artists, uh, and so on. We have, um, well, in total, there are 46,000 people united within the Creative Coalition. And uh, the Creative Coalition is, uh, well, the major player in the task force team, uh, which uh, deals directly with the the governments. And uh, well, I'm a policy director, and uh, I'm uh, for the task force team. I rep uh, represent uh, workers uh, within the negotiations with the with the, the minister of culture. So uh, yes, uh, I'm. Uh, I'm I'm quite busy uh, nowadays. It's it's really uh, strange uh, for a lot of people. Uh, actually, uh, work has dropped down well till zero, uh, and my uh, uh, email box is exploding. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm 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 working uh, very much hours, uh, and we're trying to uh, to keep up uh, the policy uh, regulations and. Uh, make sure uh, you can benefit from uh, from those uh, uh, schemes so uh, we we were the first ones to uh, address the problem of freelancers because it's not just jobs and companies but it's also a freelancers crisis and it's no a normal uh, uh, risk uh, uh, no, no normal business risk but it's really a big uh, issue for society uh, and that was one of the issues that led to the the tozo the, the the freelancer scheme and there are a lot of problems with that scheme but basically uh, it's acknowledged there should be some funding for freelancers as well uh, also uh, the other policy rules like the talks for small enterprises uh, and and so on and also the regulations uh, from the ministry uh, we addressed uh, and in uh, uh the the well the, the the costs of this period and also the losses um and there should be some additional funding by the government and well that was a bit tricky but uh uh we lobbied a lot and uh, created a lot of pressure and a lot of attention as well for the for the culture section uh and i think this is one of the uh, good things. Uh, uh, it was not really uh, something of interest in Den Haag if, for the ministers and for the cabinet. But now uh, they're really talking about events, about festivals, about museums and uh, and venues, and uh, it's it's really an issue. So uh, we managed to do that to 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 brought our problems to their attention. Uh, and to make sure we are not forgotten, because it's very easy that artists or the arts are forgotten with the policy rulings, uh, and well, you have to deal with the leftovers or get crushed between other uh, sectors. So we're we're really in the picture, and I, I think that's good. And from that on, we're working uh, towards uh, uh, better regulations for uh, for artists in. Uh, and one of the is uh, issues now is uh, rents, housing, uh, and all that kinds of, uh, of, of, of rulings, uh, because uh, the focus was for this minister really on their own practice. So uh, the structural funded uh, uh, companies and also the, uh, the, the funds which are directly uh, policy fundings from uh, the government, like the Mondrian funds, uh, 
but the local financing um well that's an an old uh, an, uh, another thing and uh we were trying to influence uh, that as well because there are negotiations now uh, between uh, the government and uh, local cities and municipalities uh and yeah it's 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 a matter of money uh, in the end the, how much do uh, local uh uh, municipalities and communities have to pay up themselves and how much they, they will uh, get funding from uh, the central government and uh, well you know uh, it's 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 uh, uh, culture fundings are always last in line within local communities uh, except some good uh, examples but in general it is uh, so if there's not uh, not so much funding from the central government, it will be uh, quite difficult for local governments to uh, support uh, institutions and artists. And one of the main issues we uh, addressed is uh, uh, the importance of the artist. Uh, um, when you look at uh, the whole field of production, 60% uh, is freelancers, and that is an, uh, a figure and a factor which is unique for the uh, cultural uh, uh, working fields and uh, well there should be some policy measures to to live up to that um and now from the 300 million uh there goes 70 million to the funds so also money to the monitoring funds so uh the, the government funds are actually going to be able to uh to 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 to, to grant uh, projects and it's a very uh, Natalie stressed it out. Uh, uh, keep applying because the, the uh, it's it's best to continue working. Um, and second best is to to have some uh, support from uh, from local uh, government from a from a TOSO, uh, uh scheme or something. But the, the best support is to stay working. And uh, well, uh, we. Uh, try to help with individual problems but mostly uh to uh yeah to to stress out in the in the task force and we work together with uh the major institutions but also with uh commercial businesses uh, to unite as a cultural and creative sector uh and to create uh, a lot of impacts uh on the cabinet and uh, address the Minister of Culture, but also the Ministry of Housing uh, and the Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Ministry of Social Affairs. So, uh, and fiscal policy rulings, uh, we also address them. So, it's a broad uh, perspective of policy issues which we are addressing. And uh, I think we were one of the first sectors who got uh, hit really hard by uh, uh, all the uh, regulations taken to uh, to fight the coronavirus and uh, I think we will be one of the last sectors to uh, adapt to the new normal or the old normal because uh, I don't know what the new normal is uh, uh, and it will take a lot of time uh, well to to get our act together and in the meantime all the policy uh, regulations which were planned, it's a reshuffle of the the government uh, funding is 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 also uh, taking place uh, and that's 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 also one issue uh, and I think it's going to last at least well uh, a year to get back to uh, a kind of normal I guess and there are also in March next year elections coming up and uh, this crisis made a lot of things people already thought that were happening visible uh, the precarity of of the artist and so it's going to be uh, uh, a continuing story uh, these months and coming year uh, to um, straighten out uh, a few policy directions and uh, to uh, achieve a better position for the artists and uh, we've only uh, started uh, now it is the first phase and it's the the, the crisis phase and there will be another phase uh, uh, from adjustments and uh, uh, and there will be a long-term change in policies and change in 
in, in, in the way uh, uh, regulations are set. And I think that's going to be uh, the next thing. So, um, well, this is what we do. Uh, it's, uh, it's policy uh, influencing, uh, actually. Thank you, Peter. And uh, if anyone's thinking, what does that look like in practice, uh, doing policy influencing, or uh, what, what about this 300 million exactly, please uh, comment. Uh, and we'll direct the questions later. Uh, and in the meanwhile, now we move to our last speaker, uh, who is Jeremy Bierbach, uh, who is a lawyer specialized in immigration law, working at Frans Advocaten. Uh, and I'm quite excited to have him here because he's one of those lawyers who are not just knowledgeable about the application of the law, but also studies its fundamentals. Uh, he just uh, a few years ago uh, finished his PhD titled Frontiers of, Frontiers of Equality in the Development of EU and US Citizenship. Uh, and he's also passionate about uh, arts workers in the Netherlands. So uh, he will give us an update now about the current situation around uh, all these things that came up before, uh, TOZO, legal status, income requirements. Uh, and once again, please feel free to post all your questions in the comment section and we'll get to that later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tip. I'm going to start my stopwatch to keep an eye on the time. Okay, so yes, I practice as an immigration lawyer and a, a large portion of my clients are self-employed persons, um, non-EU citizens who have a residence permit for the specific purpose of self-employment. And then a large portion of those are artists because what people call the artist visa, meaning you can stay here because you're considered to be a culturally important artist, is actually a residence permit for self-employment. It says, you know, um, on the back, Arbeit als Selfstandige. And one of my main concerns of advocacy from the beginning of the crisis was um, helping to let people know, you know, what kind of benefits they can claim when it's safe to do it. Um, the Dutch government announced already at the beginning of the crisis, you know, that all self-employed persons, are called debt debt payers, uh, would be allowed to claim this benefit called TOZO, the Temporary Bridging Scheme for Self-Employed Persons. Yet, um, you know, in this, you know, the, the, the funny thing is, is in Dutch welfare law, so there's one set of legislation that covers uh, the entitlement to um, social assistance. That's, that's the responsibility of the Minister of Social Affairs. And then there's immigration law. These are two separate areas of the law. And in welfare law, it says basically everybody who lives in the Netherlands legally has a right to welfare. Every, you know, so to speak, on the, on the face of it, you know, so anybody who lives in the Netherlands and who's Dutch or an EU citizen or a non-EU citizen holding a residence permit, if they go to their municipality and apply for and say, you know, I'm having trouble. I need, I need support. I can't eat. Uh, the municipality will just give you the benefit. The municipality doesn't make it its job to look at your immigration status and say, no, you're not allowed to do that. They, you know, the idea is if anybody really needs it in the Netherlands, you are allowed to get benefits. And that also goes for Tozo. So on the face of it, which was really confusing, they said everybody who is Dutch or treated as equivalent to Dutch has a right to Tozo. And that meant basically everybody with a residence here. But then you get to immigration law. So what happens when you claim this benefit is then that the municipality is obliged to tell the IND about it if you're a non-EU citizen. And what does the IND do with this information? And that's where you get into a whole hierarchy of different kinds of immigration statuses that different non-EU citizens can have. At the top of the hierarchy, is if you have a permanent residence permit, which says on the pile tight or duurzaam verblijf or long duration, you have nothing to worry about because you are in all aspects treated as equal to a Dutch citizen in that regard. You can, you absolutely do not have to fear that you have to, you don't have any requirement of working or income or supporting yourself to keep your right to stay. And then in the middle, um, you have a whole different kind of, uh, of statuses, different kinds of immigration status. Like maybe you're here staying with a partner, maybe you're a student, maybe you're a scientific researcher. And all of these, so this is the interesting, here's, you know, here's Dutch immigration law, you know, here's what it has to say. The more interesting part of my work is here's international law. Here's everything that international law has to say about different categories of immigrants' rights. And all these different categories, many of these different kinds of uh, immigrants are covered also by norms of international law, which say the Netherlands isn't free to just kick somebody out, you know, for no reason. It means certain things have to be taken into account. 
Um, so, you know, when you're here staying with a family member uh, who's, you know, who's a Dutch citizen, you're covered by one uh, piece of EU law. If you're here as a student, you're covered by another piece of EU law. If you're here as a scientific researcher, you're covered by another piece of EU law. And, um, but funnily enough, at the bottom of the hierarchy uh, in Dutch immigration law, the categories of immigrants who are not covered by any international law at all that tells them that they have any rights outside of what the Dutch government gives them are people who are here to work. People with work-related residence permits, whether it's for working as an employee or whether it's work for working in self-employment, have no extra layer of protection. They're completely subject to what Dutch law says and what the Dutch government says. So that's why it was especially really important to advocate for the rights of holders of residence permits for self-employment to get clarification from the responsible member of government, in this case, the State Secretary of uh, Justice and Security. She's the political boss of the IND, the Dutch Immigration Authority, to try and get you know uh, a, a commitment from her to say that she would not... Uh, there, there's basically two ways in which uh, social assistance can impact the right of, a, of an, any immigrant to be here. You know, when you have a residence permit uh, for stay as you know, self-employment or any residence permit, one of the conditions is you're supposed to have sufficient means to take care of yourself. And specifically, when you have a residence permit uh, for self-employment, like you're an artist and you were given this residence permit because, you know, you had important exhibitions, but you also have the requirement to earn enough money from your self-employed work to uh, sustain yourself. It's a really, It's a really precarious situation. You're not even allowed to say, that you have savings, you know, to support yourself if you're, uh, if you're self-employed work. If you're literally required at renewal time to show that you earn enough, you know, for a single person about 1,260 euros a month on average from your business activities to support yourself. So it, and, and claiming social assistance can be seen, uh, in the IND's view as a sign that you don't have enough time to support yourself. So it's a really important thing to get a commitment. So, hey, what is the IND going to do? if they get a signal that you've claimed TOZO? And secondly, can your income from TOZO count toward the income that you need to show uh, at renewal time if you have a residence permit for self-employment? And we have at least a partial victory so far. The State Secretary for Security and Justice communicated to Parliament uh, about three weeks ago. She said, don't worry, because people with a residence permit for self-employment, because you know we want them here, I mean, they were granted that residence permit because we want them here. We want, you know, they're culturally important or, you know, they're economically important. That's a harder one to get. But, um, you know, because of that, we'll allow those people uh, to claim TOZO without considering it to be a, a violation of their right of stay. Um, but the one thing she hasn't clarified yet is will that uh, income be counted? So that we're still waiting for a uh, word on it. What's happening right now, of course, right? All we have right now is there's no, uh, the, the actual, the actual legislation has to be made still. The actual regulations still have to be written and published. It's in the, uh, policy handbook that is, you know, that is the guide for the IND called the Frame Dealing and Secret I imagine the civil servants at the IND are still working it out and they're going back and forth to the state secure, secretary of security government. But so far, all we know, uh, for artists who have a residence permit, Arbeit or self Sonica, work in self-employment, is at least you can, you know, you don't have to worry about being kicked out uh, for claiming TOZO. That's this weird disconnect, you know, as I was saying in the, in the Dutch system, is that everybody has a right to welfare, but some people can be kicked out for claiming welfare. As I like to say, the, the, the only way to explain the system is they don't want you to be homeless and hungry, you know, uh, and, and looking bad, hanging out on the street up until the moment that they kick you out, um, which is, you know, the sort of cruelty of the, of the system. They want to keep everything nice, you know, until the last moment. Um, so we know at least that artists, you know, they're not using the same What we don't know yet is does that uh, count toward their income that they need to show that they're, you know, supporting themselves with from their business? And what we also don't know yet is there's also been nothing said about people with other statuses. And I'm slightly over the time, but I will just briefly address that because I know it's been a concern uh, for other people. Like, what if you have a residence permit for stay as somebody's partner? Are you allowed to claim TOZO? I mean, on the one hand, you can say, um, well, you weren't granted the right to be here specifically to be self-employed. So the same political uh, idea doesn't apply. You know, the idea is you're not, that's not your primary purpose of stay. But at the same time, if you're here for stay with a family member, if you're here for stay with a partner, um, 
the Dutch government's ability to kick you out is also limited by international law and your right to family life, which is a human right. So again, you know, there's no hard and fast answer, but it really all has to do with uh, the question of, um, uh, you know, would, would it be disproportionate to kick you out just for claiming Tozo, just even temporarily and things like that. So we're still waiting uh, for more clear answers and the actual, you know, the actual uh, distinct wording of the of the regulations on that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for uh, explaining all the, those things that are clear or not clear yet. I think uh, I suspect you already answered some of the questions. Uh, but let's see if there are any more because uh, now it is time to uh, hand over moderation. I don't, and there's uh, too much information, I guess. Everybody is a bit woo woo. Well, I have to uh, see to that. Uh, uh, one thing in uh, in regard to uh, what uh, what Jeremy uh, was saying, uh, we will keep uh, keep a close look at what's happening uh, on those regulations because it's important uh, what the uh, the ministry uh, writes down in letters uh, and answers to uh, the parliament because uh, yeah a lot of a lot of regulations have to be worked out and be published uh, so there's nothing uh, officially legal in that but uh, when it comes to a case it's it's it will be important what was the uh, the purpose of uh, of this regulation, uh, and I think um, we're we're making some steps uh, towards a, a better situation for precarious workers who are kind of in the in, in the loop between immigration law and uh, 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 social security law. Okay. Uh, thank you. So um, I have been keeping track of the comment section on the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your feedback and your questions. And um, I think the artists at W139 have been reading along, but you're getting a very big shout out for all the technical accomplishments. They are fantastic. Um, we received a couple of questions, and I'd like to start with the first one, uh, which was asked by uh, Pilar Mata Dupont. And she has a question for Jeremy. Uh, and the question is, can a self-employed worker who has a non-permanent visa through a partner, like a partner visa, apply for TOZO without risking their status? Unfortunately, I can only give the, the notorious lawyer's answer to that question. It depends. It really all depends. Um, but like I said, it also it depends, first of all, on what is the nationality of your partner. Um, if, you, uh, if your partner themselves has an unconditional right to stay in the Netherlands, so if your partner is themselves Dutch, or if your partner is, is, is an EU citizen who's been here for a long time, then I would say um it's pretty hard to kick you out and then it's pretty hard to kick you out just for claiming uh tozo especially if it's just on a temporary basis because all the when you're because it's really about your human right to family life article 8 of the european convention on human right uh and so especially if you know um if your partner is it, you know this is the only place they can be this is where they have a permanent right to live um, it would be a violation of both your rights to kick you out just for, you know, just for like a little blip, you know, as I call it, of, of making use of this bit of social system. Of course, it is always, you know, when you have a right to stay here as a Dutch, as the partner of a Dutch citizen, one of the conditions for getting that residence permit was them showing that they have enough income to support yourself. 
And nowadays, of course, they look at both your income together. Um, but again, I think if it's, you know, it's, it errs more, it, the balance is more on the side of you and your interests than it is on the side of the interests of the Dutch state. So again, I can't, I can't say for sure, but I can say my general feeling is, especially if you're here for stay with a partner who's living here permanently, um, it, yeah, it would be what's called disproportionate. Uh, it would be a violation of EU law and various international laws to kick you out just for making use of a benefit when it's clearly outside of your control and due to the corona crisis. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the very clear answer. And then the second question is for Julia. Uh, I have a question that came in through YouTube from May Heek. Uh, and this person has a question about the payment agreement of installments that Urban Resort offers to their tenants. And she was, um, the question is if you would advise uh, to agree with these installments or not? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I would, I cannot advise anything. Uh, first of all, um, I, I'm not very, uh, I'm not very good in Dutch law, but what I, from what I heard, uh, it is actually uh, like, it, it is against the law not to inform your landlord about your situation if you are late with the payment. So, it, there is this kind of category of a good tenant and I think uh, definitely uh, urban resort has also been quite forthcoming and they are they t put a lot of effort into contacting every tenant individually according to their situation but also they have said that if someone cannot afford the rent they cannot afford the rent so they would advise them to look for another house which I think is not a good thing to say in a good time like i think mm -hmm. there should be some more space to be given to people who don't know what their situation is yet to be able to make this kind of a decision what we are doing now is that we're lobbying together with uh, the apple and uh, platform bk actually sent this amazing letter to the ministers about uh, the rent um, support we are hoping that uh, some kind of development in that matter will speed up our situation uh, with, the, with, the, with this kind of commitment to um, essentially going into debt um, with the rent. And we're also encouraging uh, the, 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 the neighbors, the people who are in the, in the Blutplatzen to just contact each other and talk to each other. So we can actually count how many people are in a desperate situation so maybe we can think of other ways of supporting them rather than uh, like just simply push the responsibility on yeah. individuals basically uh, but uh, it is a complicated process because urban resort also isn't is in a way this kind of like administrator who is also a preca precarious uh, entity and uh, that's a bigger discussion about the Brut Plus system in general and about uh, what are art communities and how, um, uh, yeah, and like, is the system working basically? It's like a really complicated matter. I wouldn't advise, I, I can do what, I, I can say what I did. I paid my rent for uh, April. Now I am late with my rent already for one week. I should have paid until the end of, uh, of April for, for the May rent. Uh, and I am waiting for another Tozo. I cannot uh, afford spending uh, 650 euros on rent at the moment because this is my grocery money. So, um, and I'm not going to ask to, to go into, uh, into debt. I'm not going to call uh, to, it's just, uh, uh, I think that I have a right to have uh, at least one month of being late, but of course it's uh, something that I um, signaled to the to my administration. I had I I think it's very uh, it's very urgent uh, to really stress that everybody has to uh, be clear about their intentions and about their situation, and they should not be afraid also to go uh, to to claim their right to have more time. That's what I would advise. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we also got two questions uh, from uh, Katayun Junvol at YouTube. Um, and 
Margarita, maybe we can uh, introduce Sakiko also for this uh, for this question because um, Katayun is asking how can we stimulate solidarity and or dialogue between artists and other art workers, other art workers being everyone who is involved in the art field from the technicians to uh, the gallery workers to the curators, uh, our art field. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nadia. Um, yeah, uh, Katayun, I think it's great you brought this up. This is something that we were going to sort of uh, bring in towards the end, but it's great to also bring it in now. Um, so I wanted to uh, um, ask, uh, introduce to Kiko uh, Sugawa, who's a cultural worker um, and has been doing a lot of uh, research on reproductive labor in the last several years. Um, and in the course of this research, she became really involved in the labor movements led by domestic workers in the U.S. and in the Netherlands. Um, and I was in touch with her about um, advocacy work that she's doing now for um, undocumented um, uh, domestic migrants in the Netherlands. So um, I'd love to bring her in uh, to answer that question and also introduce her um, into the conversation as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sakiko Sugawa. And Thank you, Margarita, for asking me to be, take part of this session. And I have been thinking about the, the idea of solidarity a lot, um, and also how we can organize ourselves, not within the cultural sector, but beyond. And for that, um, I think we, the cultural workers, need to ask ourselves, including myself, like besides talking about and um, representing political and the social issues in the institutions, have we actually fought for other workers in the past? Have we, have we done enough to, to support uh, workers in other sectors? Have we showed up for other workers in the past? Like, are we willing to do that in the future? Because the funding cut that our cultural workers are facing is mm -hmm. part of larger tide, right? Like this neoliberal policies that have been mm -hmm. implemented um, in the Netherlands and across the globe. So demanding and securing funding only for cultural sector is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. Like if we really want to turn the tide, then we really have to um, build broader coalitions with uh, workers in different sectors and that's the type of lessons that I, I have been learning from domestic workers in New York City and in the Netherlands because domestic workers uh, the people that I have met have always showed up they have showed up for other undocumented workers um, workers in the cleaning sectors and they really represent the, the sense of solidarity to me. So I think we really need to start learning how to do that, how to really show up for one another. Um, that's the good challenge I think in front of us. And I am here because um, I think my role today is sort of communicate and amplify the situation and needs of domestic workers in the Netherlands. And I understand that the, the situation the, uh, cultural workers uh, are facing right now is also very severe and challenging, but so are domestic workers because um, they have no sec social security to begin with. So, and most of them, uh, are undocumented, meaning that are, they have, um, yeah, they have no access to social security, and they also work uh, based on no work, no pay basis. So, and the, since the beginning of pandemic, seven, like most domestic workers, have lost seventy-five percent to hundred percent of income. So we were actually looking at the, the, the crisis, real crisis of 
that the workers are facing. And most of domestic workers coming from um, global south have dependents in the home countries who rely on domestic workers' uh, income. So, I mean, this is also like uh, one of the, 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 the challenge that are, the questions that we should ask ourselves, like, can we really show up for domestic workers? Can we really support and, and stand in solidarity with domestic workers? And my role or what I have been doing um, since the beginning of pandemic is to, to really listen to what's going on now, the, the, the situation domestic workers is facing and sharing that information with my friends. So I, I have been writing emails um, to my friends um, and also raising money um, because domestic workers are in danger of being evicted. And they also face the, yeah, some of them even don't have a money for food. So we were trying to, my friends and I were trying to raise money. And also we were asking employers of domestic workers to keep, uh, to protect employment. So just like um, the regular employed people have protections, like if something happens or during this crisis, they can, they are protected by laws. Uh, they have a labor protections, but domestic workers don't. So we are urging uh, current employers of domestic workers to follow the provision granted to workers, regardless of their status. And also amplifying the, 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 the needs and situation of domestic workers. And I consider these uh, little act, these little things, texting, emailing, raising money, sharing as concrete forms of solidarity. And that's something that I think uh, all of us can do. And on that, uh, do I have, do I still have a few minutes? Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there are a um, few uh, initiatives that I, I would like to share using this opportunity. So if any of you or people who are watching this session, um, if they want to be involved or if they are interested in um, working with domestic workers, uh, there are a couple of initiatives that are, I would like to share. And of course, like the, the information that I'm going to talk about will be on Facebook and on YouTube. So people can look it up later too. So first, um, there's a crowdfunding campaign started by uh, FMV's domestic workers. So you can, there's a link on the, the uh, Facebook and YouTube, so you can donate um, money to that funding and this money will be distributed to domestic workers in the Netherlands. And there's also another initiative called Mask of Solidarity, uh, initiated by Black Renaissance. And this uh, project asks you to donate money in exchange for a mask uh, volunteers produce. And so these two uh, initiatives are something like we can actually donate to. And another thing um, that's going on is that my friends and I are trying to create a network of allies who aims to think through and organize a long-term, more longer form of social security for domestic workers. So the, the actions that are, I, have been, I have talked about are kind of emergent um, 
urgent uh, forms of social security. But we also like to talk, you know, think about the longer term social security for domestic workers with domestic workers. So if you are interested in uh, getting involved, uh, please email us. I think I put my email address um, on the YouTube and Facebook as well. And another thing that uh, you can um, support is that uh, so domestic workers in the Netherlands has been fighting for ratification, uh, ILO ratification of C189, which is the convention that recognize domestic work as work. And it asks signers to create labor protections and social security for people who engage with domestic work. And they have been leading this struggle for many, many years in this country. And they need support from cultural workers from everywhere. And I think, um, we can show up uh, whenever they organize protests, whenever they organize campaign. Um, I can also collect an um, email address and let everyone know if something is coming up uh, in relation to this campaign. So I think that's that. I, th uh, I think I've said everything I wanted to say. Thank you so much. And I think, um, I hope that we've been able to keep up in the chat because I've been posting all the relevant links to the pages and the GoFundMe page also that you've shared. Thank uh, you. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, there was a second part to Katayun's question, uh, which I'll address now which is, can we discern that there is more focus on artists and that independent curators are overlooked in these discussions? Is there anyone from maybe Platform BK or maybe Peter uh, who could tell us a little bit more about the position of curators in regards to her question? Peter? Well, curators are uh, not a specific uh, group, uh, nor for policy makers, nor in law. So they're treated uh, actually the same as artists. So there are, uh, uh, for, for applying for TOZO, uh, th there are the same regulations. Uh, and when you're a curator, uh, well, you can also apply with the Mondrian funds or other projects for funds, uh, sometimes in collaboration with a presentation instilling or sometimes with an artist. Uh, but as a curator, you're, well, a bit between. So uh, that's the negative uh, side. The positive side, you're in between. You can also look at artists, but also look at uh, galleries and uh, presentation institutions for work and uh, to collaborate with. Yes, but, but in, no, terms of, uh, um, in terms of solidarity, yeah. well, in terms of, was what in her terms of solidarity, uh, as a curator, as I would be a curator, I, 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 I would feel solidarity with both because uh, you represent artists and you want to show artists, but also uh, uh, you want to. Uh, expose them uh, in galleries or in presentation institutions. So I think you're really uh, in between uh, as a curator. And sometimes you have also the head artist, you're actually an artist and a curator, that can be as well. But as the function curator, uh, you're actually in the middle, I guess. Yeah. yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. I think there might be some questions mm -hmm. also because um oh, i'm just getting can everyone hear me yeah um perfect um from the contributing speakers uh, tonight i just saw a post from Esam uh, on youtube <laughs> um perhaps Esam, uh, you would like to address your question in this setting as well 
Sure, thank you. Yeah, the, the question is very simple. Uh, what is the regulation with uh, talks? And if the individual artists or cultural workers can also apply for talks? Okay. Jeremy, you would like to answer that question? Yes, yes, I think I can answer it. Um, yes, TOGS is, um, so, you know, if TOZO is, you know, meant as the sort of primary, the first form of uh, support that any self-employed person can get, including ones, you know, who are just pure freelancers, they're working from the capital in their head and that's what they run their business with. TOGS is sort of the next step um, in my view, it's more oriented toward, uh, it is slightly more oriented toward businesses that have more external expenses, you know, that are, that, that are more sort of bricks and mortar, like they have to rent a space, like a shop or something like that, and they have to be able to pay the rent uh, on it. And, um, but that aside, I mean, um, basically the, they made the qualification, like who qualifies and who doesn't, really easy. They basically just made a list of certain what are they called sdi codes sbi codes i believe uh if in your kvk registration you will have a series of S sdi codes if you look up your kvk registration then you can go to the rvo website on togs and see in the first place um you know is your business qualified classified as one of those types of uh, businesses and so you know i think most of the time if you if you have if you have that qualified sbi code then you can just you know, you can just apply for it and get it. It's, um, if you're, uh, yeah, I, again, I also don't, I don't, even though uh, if you're an immigrant and you have a, you know, a residence permit based on that, I mean, I think this, you know, the, the as far as I know, the, uh, the State Secretary of Security and Justice hasn't specifically said anything about, um, about TOGS, but I mean, I think it's the same thing qualifies, but I would just, I would just keep, I would, I do sort of warn my clients that, you know, um, it, you should only maybe, it maybe it's only safest to apply for TOGS if you really have some demonstrable sort of external expenses that you had to pay with your business, like, you know, like rent or, or if you had subcontractors, you know, if you had, if you had, a, if you had an assistant assisting you with your work, who is counting on that money and counting on you to pay them, yes, then definitely use it for that. But it's, TOGS is less for you yourself. It's less about you and your own personal income. I would say so those those are the things you should keep in mind is it a qualifying business and do I really need this to pay external expenses yeah may I ask a question of course uh, yeah uh, thank you Jeremy for, for this I I would like to ask um, uh, the, the the Dutch government has been pushing the artists and cultural workers to become entrepreneurs um, so um, we have resisted, I think, for many years, but uh, slowly we have be became entrepreneurs, as you said, by registering in KVK, in the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so now uh, the, the way that you have been registered at, in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the, this code that you have, is actually essentially how the, the government sees you, right? So. Is that, is that, um, can somebody change the, the code? Can they kind of change their mind and say, well, I'm a, I'm an artist, but maybe I'm also a designer. Uh, I'm also uh, uh, something else as well, because we have to be different people in the art sector. We are not only one. So can somebody suddenly change the code? Uh, or is that uh, something that a kind of, uh, is there some kind of rule that maybe in January or March you were in this bracket and you have to stay forever there? Well, on the face of it, the, the TOGS itself, the TOGS regulation itself says you had to have this code before uh, March 13th or March 17th. So they wanted to prevent abuse by saying, you know, by people just suddenly deciding uh, that, they, that they do a qualifying business. However, there is a lot of leniency. There is room to say, but look, actually, I really do have that kind of business. So you can apply for an exception based on showing the work that you've actually been doing. So if it really, if you, if you do have something to show from before the pandemic started, and you can say, really, I, I ought to qualify for this category, then I do understand that they are being lenient and granting talks um, after all. So this, does this apply to artists and their studio spaces? Can artists apply for the cost of their studio spaces? 
Uh, that's a good question. I have to look it up. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, Fosca S B S B I codes is what it's called. Um, it's all on S B I codes that are. Yeah, it's all on rvo.nl slash. Uh, well, it's a long ones, but if you just look up, you Google on RVO and Togs. Um, but um, yeah, there were certain cultural uh, fields. Let's see, culture, sport, and recreation. Um, if you're a performing artist, if you're a producer of uh, performing artists, if you're circus or variety, if you are providing services for executing art, if you're a theater, if you're an event hall, if you're, and then it goes on to other things that private people won't be, if you're a public library, if you're at things like that. But yeah, it does look like there are quite a few um, uh, categories of, but it does seem to be, um, it looks like it's more performing artists than visual artists, I do have to say. That does seem to be a, a distinction that they're making. Okay. Um Thank you so much. I think um, I would like to ask Natalie uh, also to address your questions that you've been uh, posting on YouTube, if you would. Maybe you need to unmute. Thank you. Yeah, hi. I also have to say I, I missed a bit of uh, what Jeremy was just saying now about talks. So, uh, because my internet cut off and I needed to buy more data. Uh, um, so I might be a bit in the blank. Maybe you could like ask me directly the question you would want me to respond to. Yeah, you were, you made a remark on, on YouTube um, that the talks uh, should also apply for the presentation institutions, but that they seem yeah, to well, be falling. Exactly. Yeah, so this is what uh, uh, Jeremy was, I think, was just talking about. And we've been, you know, uh, asking uh, amongst our members if they are applying. We don't have a, a specific overview yet or if they have been considering applying. And what we have um, learned is that uh, all the SBI codes seem really pretty random. Uh, so, for instance, MAMA is indicated as scheppende kunst en schrijven, mm -hmm. um, which is because our origin is an artist-run uh, project, actually. Um, and then for other presentatie instellingen, there would be like a very specific educational category, uh, which they have been allocated in. And um, I mean, for at this point at MAMA, because we have figured that our individual financial damages are relatively minimum because we don't do ticket sales. We have decided not to go through the whole circus and just kind of like um, take the punches we get. So, and not kind of like in infringe on uh, resources which are uh, needed more uh, urgently by others but it is an issue and it's also like a very um, confusing administration uh, administrative procedure in the yeah. end yeah so, so um, maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit on this as well thank you Natalie by the way and you can watch the whole video afterwards we'll keep it online <laughs> yes thank you yeah, just a little bit about the talks is that um, at this point, visual artists are indeed not uh, eligible for the talks. Uh, not just because they're not one of the SBI codes that are included in the list now, which could in the future possibly still expand because they're uh, adding codes uh, as we go. Uh, but we also have to keep in mind that in order to uh, have the right to have talks, you have to have uh, an address registered, uh, uh, a working uh, address, which is not your living address, which of course for a lot of freelancers and artists is not the case. Um, so yeah, to be realistic, I would say do not count it. Also, you have to prove that your uh, expenses over the three, three months are higher than 4,000 euros, which might also not be the case. Um, 
So yeah, it, it, it might still happen that artists will be uh, added to the SBI codes, but there are still a lot of problems there. Mm. Um, also, uh, on another note, it was quite asked if the, what about the curators? Uh, I would say that this once again shows the real urgency of the fair practice code. And I would advise everyone who hasn't had a look at that themselves to go back to it and see what are the principles of fair practice, such as fair share uh, and uh, the, the, the base uh, values of it, such as solidarity, uh, because these, uh, this code is not just a, a document, it's a policy document embraced by it, our government. So by reading that, you can see uh, what rights you have according to our government at this moment. And I think that's very good because solidarity is in there and we have uh, something to base ourselves on and to further uh, uh, yeah. the action. Thank you for elaborating uh, on this as well, Sepp. Essam, I saw a question coming in from you, which I've heard uh, multiple times, unfortunately, over the past couple of weeks. What to do when your Tozo uh, is not uh, coming in, in your, into your bank account? Is there someone yeah. who can answer this? Yes, and I wanted to add, if I may, uh, like, how long do you have to wait? And if you wait like a month and you haven't heard anything, what kind of actions can you take? Jeremy? I mean, I guess I can say, I, I believe, well, first of all, you, you know, if you received an email uh, confirmation after you applied for it, because of course you had to log in with your Diki Day, you should definitely see that you got an email confirmation. I, I, I actually know this from personal experience because my husband applied for Tozo like before it was fully worked out and he never got a confirmation and never heard anything. So then we just reapplied again. And this time it seemed to go right. Um, so if you didn't get a, I mean, because then you got an email conversation, um, uh, email confirmation. Um, so yeah, if you didn't get an email confirmation, then I'd say something went wrong. Maybe you should just log in to the uh, to the website of the municipality and try again. But I do know that yeah, municipalities were saying you know expect it to possibly take. Yeah, I'd say over four weeks is a little bit long. So then I would call the municipality. I mean, but when you do get it, of course, it will be retroactive. Uh, as of uh, March 1st, you get the full amount as long as you apply before the end of May. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we've addressed most of the questions, if not all of them, uh, on YouTube. Uh, and perhaps we can uh, go towards our closing statements. Mm -hmm. I just want to add one thing. There is a conversation about um, Platform Beka um creating a um uh, like doing the same sort of fee system that is in place for artists and the um oh my god now i'm forgetting the the kunstenars honorarium system yeah. um so there is like a working group which i'm also in right now for uh, independent curators um and to develop um also a system of uh sort of guidelines for fees for independent curators so uh just so people know that in the chat, it hasn't been like it's uh, in the in process right now. But um, yeah, it is an interesting conversation about whether these distinctions are made between artists and curators, other kinds of cultural workers, um, because it takes a lot of uh, different kinds of workers to make this system function. Um, and also how we can sort of link ourselves to other workers in general, um, because we really see um, the precarity of a lot of people's situations becoming much more visible now. Um, yeah, but I thought I would just add that in uh, at the end. Um, I have a lot of thank yous, but I don't know if you wanted to say something else, Nadia. No, 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 I'm... go for it. <laughs> Uh, well, one thing I wanted to mention is that like we gave this event like a plural name um, because we saw it as like the first of many and not necessarily that like we are necessarily the ones that are gonna have to keep doing the events over and over again or we could um but that other people can also take this up um and start opening up these conversations between people um because the more knowledge we share amongst each other the more we can also advocate for one another um and for ourselves so really trying to understand um these systems so it's really great to have like everyone here um who's also advocating um 
on our behalf, um, but also seeing how we can come together, um, like what uh, Tatiana was, uh, was talking about earlier. Um, so yeah, I wanted to say like a big thank you to the, uh, all the people at the W139, to Petra, to Bert, to Dave, Dawson, Nelmery, and Thorsten, who are in the space, um, making everything work really smooth. Uh, it was really cool to have this kind of uh, setup. I haven't seen anything like this uh, with all of the <laughs> video things I've been part of. So uh, I think it's really great um, to create like a spatial um, space. And they've been working so hard, uh, testing and testing and testing um, to get this up. Um, and also a big thank you to our speakers, to Aysan, to Alina, Julia, Sakiko, Yara, Tatiana, uh, to Jeremy, to Peter, to Natalie, and also to Nadia and Kuhn and Sepp uh, for organizing this together um, with me. Um, so that's my big thank you. I don't know if anyone has uh, more to add. Oh, thank you. <laughs> of uh, really making this work and putting all this effort and uh, initiative into it. Yeah, into it. yeah I mean, it's, it's also worth thinking that this is indeed just the beginning of a conversation of also how we want things to look like once th when this is done, because it was announced today, right, that rules are going to be relaxed starting June 1st. So there's like this, indeed, as Natalie mentioned, this push to like open up to like start organizing things and to like st step back into normal life. But actually, I don't think things should go back to how they used to be because they were not working, not at all. Maybe, can I add something on that point of Alina? Because I think there's like in this movement of opening up again, I think we're all very like community-based indiv <laughs> individuals or operations or projects or that's what, kind of keeps us going is actually our gathering and it's important. Um, but as we do so and rethink what our work should be, I think also there's a level of thinking about how are we sharing the public space and who, how are we, will we be putting pressure on the public space and that still thinking about alternatives online are a very valid position parallel to also finding contained moments to meet up mm -hmm. and maybe acknowledging that in certain spaces where such as mama which there's not ticket sales and we have less of an economic uh, impulse to open up it might be better that the shoe shoe shop opens up you know or the small retail shop um and just kind of like share this public space in a way which is responsible yeah. thank you um, I also wanted to say that I um, I'm really looking forward to join the um, think tank that Tatiana was talking about at the beginning because I think that this last uh, couple of weeks was like really intense uh, on an energetic level of uh, really finding an urgency to collaborate and to really know each other and it was actually a really good uh, period I think like really promising um, and uh, I've learned a lot and I think uh, it would be great if we start with educating ourselves a little bit more about uh, how the city actually functions, why are we not that happy with certain things, what could be improved and uh, yeah I, I hope that actually this uh, solidarity, solidarity series uh, will uh, continue uh, in a, on an organization level let's say. Yeah, if I may say, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that, that this um, a wave of solidarity is taking over and I hope it will hold on much longer than just uh, when there is a, a direct need because I think it's very important to, to, to kind of go on, uh, as Natalie was saying, not only in a few months but also after. So I, I hope that many people will, will join also, not only on a temporary basis, but when uh, with some kind of long-term agenda as well to keep on um, seeing ourselves as, uh, as Lucy Lippard was saying, like um, a coalition for art workers. And who are the art workers? It's all of us. And I really like what uh, Sakiko was saying as well, um, to also align ourselves with workers in other sectors. So not to isolate ourselves, um, not to see ourselves in an art bubble, which is a very cozy place and I really enjoy it, 
uh, but it's also nice to kind of maybe join with other bubbles <laughs> uh, or maybe burst our own bubble a little bit um, and, and get out of it a little bit and, and, and reach out to other workers as well and not see ourselves as, as, the, um, as the only ones who are suffering. I'm not saying that we are, but the, that we should also realize like the solidarity at large in society as well. So I, I think it's, it's very important. And uh, I don't know if W139 wants to continue to organize this kind of sessions, but um, if they are, I'm really supportive of that. Uh, I know it's a lot of work, but um, I think it, it, this continu continuity in the art world is kind of a problem for us because we all have double jobs and we are busy doing a lot of different things, but it would be really nice if, it, if there is like an anchor um, in one organization or a couple that are kind of working together to maybe keep it all, all like once a month or I don't know how, how often, but the frequency is less important, but uh, to keep the energy and the flow of energy going. Um, as uh, To come just back to briefly to what Julia was saying, um, I, I think there is a lot of knowledge, but also a lot of misconceptions about how the art policies are formed. Uh, I think it would be very important to, and I'm very hopeful that we can kind of at Platform BK also organize information days, maybe something like this, like Zoom meeting or <laughs> uh, about uh, all this kind of stuff, uh, uh, which can be tedious, but uh, you see when, when we are in trouble, uh, we need to know and be informed really about uh, simple things like how much is the, is the rent take, you know, for studio spaces? Is it too much? What should we do about it? I think it's an essential thing. And it's going to be even more important in future uh, to kind of build our base together and make sure that our base is solid as artists, that we are not left hanging in the air and suffering so much when these kind of things happen. It really breaks my heart to see so many people not being able to work or stopping with their projects because of this. So. Yeah, my, my, I think on a, more po a very positive note, I, I think, um, um, yeah, I, I'm very optimistic about the art sector, you know, being very vigilant and very energetic and surviving this together. So, yeah, that, that's my closing. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That seems like a positive way to, uh, to end. So thank you so much, everyone, and to all of our friends watching over uh, YouTube. Um, we'll also uh, share uh, the links that we shared um, on the website and on the Facebook event page so you can access them outside of the YouTube chat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. It was great. I'm so excited about your think tank. I'm like, 